Uh, let me begin by thanking uh, Professor Suthipant and the organizing committee of this webinar for giving me this uh, excellent opportunity to share my thoughts. It's indeed uh, an honor for me to share the panel with Professor Amitavacharya, uh, who is an inspiration really for hundreds of Southeast Asia scholars like me. Uh, uh, my task becomes even more difficult because uh, uh, the point of view that he has uh, put, put forth on Indo-Pacific, I'm, I'm going to uh, stand on the other side in the sense that I'll be defending uh, Indo-Pacific construct from India's point of view. Uh, I thought for, uh, for the sake of greater clarity, I'd just share a uh, PowerPoint. Um, now the topic I have chosen uh, this morning is much discussed and debated uh, and that is India's engagement with the Southeast Asian region in the context of Act East policy and the Indo-Pacific engagement. I have titled it as uh, where Act East meets Indo-Pacific, uh, as you can see on the screen. Now, what do I mean by this? I believe that there is a lot of convergence between India's Act East policy and this fast emerging Indo-Pacific construct. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the initial years, till 2018 and 19, it was more or less the same. Like you could use these terms Act East and Indo-Pacific almost interchangeably. Sorry. Uh, that to my mind is changing now. I believe that India's Indo-Pacific approach goes beyond the Act East horizon on a number of counts, even though Act East uh, remains one of the most principal tools of India's eastward engagement. The second central piece of my argument uh, today is that in both its Act East policy and Indo-Pacific approaches, Southeast Asia and ASEAN have remained at the center, no doubt about it. Even though the focus on mechanisms, institutions, policies, and India's own role conception is changing. And role conception here is uh, how uh, Holstey defines it. But these developments are also premised on the success of Look East and Act East policies, as we uh, understand it now. Uh, and it is beyond doubt, beyond doubt that Act East has been one of the most effective flagship policy initiatives at the regional level. Now, before I elaborate this further, I think uh, uh, we should quickly go through uh, the nuts and bolts of India's engagement with the East. Uh, if we take a closer look at the overall picture of India's eastward engagement, it becomes clear that India, like China, is one of the oldest stakeholders and partners in the Southeast Asian region. This engagement is two, uh, actually more than two millennia old. And here, if I'm allowed to do a little bit of self-promotion, I would like to refer to my co-authored book uh, titled uh, India's Eastward Engagement, Anti From Antiquity to Act East Policy, uh, this book that I co-authored with Professor S.D. Muni, we have tried to bust several myths about India's engagement with Southeast Asia. And it is important uh, also to understand uh, how India's Look East, Act East, and now Indo-Pacific engagement is unfolding. Uh, and uh, our argument is that in the, it is Indo-Pacific is India's return to, uh, to history. It, in, it is India's return to the region. Uh, in this book, we have argued that there are seven waves of India's millennia old engagement with the East. And here by East, we mean uh, the entire Southeast Asian region, East Asia, Oceania, and also some parts of the wider Indian Ocean region. To a great extent, this region is covered under the ambit of the Act East policy. Uh, but the Indo-Pacific covers even more uh, areas in terms of uh, areas, it covers even more countries and goes beyond the areas that were covered earlier in all the phases of India's eastward engagement. Uh, we've argued that there are seven key waves and wavelets and imprints of all these waves are visible even today. And any assessment of India's engagement with the Southeast Asian region cannot afford to miss these elements. For example, the diaspora question, Indians in, in Malaysia or in, um, in Thailand or in Burma, uh, the current situation also cannot be uh, 
fully understood without taking into account how uh, and to what extent Indians uh, overseas played a role in shaping India's freedom struggle, uh, the movement. So to a great extent with its Act East and Indo-Pacific policies, India is making a return to history. And today, as in the past, the Southeast Asian region is at the core of this engagement. So there is both continuity and change. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to get into the details of all of these phases. I'll just quickly flag these. Uh, you can see the, the seven phases here, seven waves of engagement. What I've also planned to do is uh, quickly run through some pictures, I thought, uh, you'd, uh, which represent uh, these waves of India's engagement uh, with the Southeast Asian and the East Asian region. And I'm sure you'll recognize uh, all these pictures. Uh, this, of course, is the Chola Empire, the territories that were occupied by the Chola uh, Empire and uh, areas that were under their influence. Uh, the free routes, the cultural imprints of India on Southeast Asia, uh, the British period where India was a British colony and yet controlled, uh, it was the headquarters for British, British operations in Southeast Asia. I think India's engagement with Southeast Asia and vice versa cannot be really uh, uh, substantiated more uh, than by saying that the last emperor of India was exiled to a Southeast Asian country, Myanmar, and he died there. And the last king of Myanmar, uh, King uh, Thibaw, was exiled to a, a, a city in uh, Maharashtra in, in India. And he uh, uh, later on died here. You know about the Burma, Thailand, the death railway uh, is much debated, Indian freedom struggle, Nehru and India's normative contribution to the international system. Uh, and later on, of course, it collapsed. Uh, even during the Cold War years, these engagements were very strong, uh, the look east, and now coming to the act east policy. I thought all of this was important because, uh, because this popular myth that India's act east policy is new and it only started with the look east and before that India was absent in the region is a, a popular myth at its best. Uh, and majority of Western scholars have argued that on those lines, which uh, I thought uh, was not right. Now, if you look at India's act east policy, I think there is no need to reiterate that it was launched in 2014 by Prime Minister Modi, it, it is more action oriented. These seven points, I think, uh, encapsulate the essence of India's Act East policy. Uh, if you look at military exercises, for example, or strategic partnership, uh, high level visits of the, not just the Prime Minister, but also uh, his important cabinet ministers, institutional changes within the Ministry of External Affairs, ASEAN Division, Indo-Pacific States Division, MOD, Ministry of Defense and MEA Co Coordination and Cooperation, Defense Exercises and Consultation in India Philippines is a classic example that building India's own capabilities and connecting with Southeast Asia, Sagarmala infrastructure development in the Northeastern region, uh, although uh, slightly slow than expected, but it is happening. And widening of the region uh, with Pacific Island Forum, uh, East Asia engagements and also the Indo-Pacific. And at the core of all of this is ASEAN at the bilateral, sub-regional, regional levels, multiple mechanisms, adding also uh, the state-centric dimension to connect Northeastern provinces of India with the Southeast Asian region. But uh, no policy is a perfect one. And uh, the same applies with India's Act East policy. RCEP withdrawal uh, was a major setback for India's uh, engagement. There are capacity shortfalls, delivery deficits, uh, connectivity has been a problem. India, Myanmar, Thailand, for example, is a, is a major challenge there. Uh, there's also this reciprocity challenge, uh, which means that Southeast Asian countries at, at times when you speak to people in the government of India, they feel that uh, Southeast Asian uh, responses have not been that, uh, that warm. And that perhaps is also uh, contributed to this uh, challenge. Now, if we look at the 
uh, Indo-Pacific, India and the Indo-Pacific. I think it is very clear that uh, Indo-Pacific is, uh, it started as uh, an extension of India's Actis policy. Actis was in fact uh, considered as the principal tool uh, also because of the fact that ASEAN is and has been at the center of India's uh, eastward engagement. Uh, it is uh, one of the core elements of India's uh, Indo-Pacific engagement also, but also expands to major powers, Japan, US, Australia, and France. Uh, growing importance of uh, major power engagement, something that was absent during the Cold War years and even during the Look East uh, policy phases. Now with Act East and Indo-Pacific now, India has tried to contribute elements of normative dimension while accommodating American interest in the region. And I think the biggest example there is how the contours of Indo-Pacific have been defined. Inclusive, for instance, is uh, I would argue is India's contribution. Of course, it was facilitated very strongly, supported by Japan, but uh, it was nowhere there in American approach. ASEAN centrality is another one. India was the first country which said that ASEAN is at the center of Indo-Pacific and we are not going to go away from that uh, policy. Later on, I think uh, uh, within two months time, Japan uh, sided with India and said, yes, uh, ASEAN is and will always remain at the, at the center of uh, our Indo-Pacific approaches and America uh, later on followed. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we, we'll just uh, look at the uh, words in red, inclusive, open, centrality of ASEAN, uh, not a strategy, not a club to dominate, uh, and at the same time, uh, not, not directed against any country. So India's vision for the Indo-Pacific region is an inclusive one. This was uh, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi in 2018 when he launched uh, India's Indo-Pacific uh, policy officially. So I think based on the above, uh, based on the, uh, what was mentioned earlier, it is very clear that India's Indo-Pacific approach is free, open, prosperous, inclusive, ASEAN centrality, uh, but it also stands for greater normative elements in this emerging regional construct. And uh, all those who study regionalism and uh, regional orders uh, know that regions are artificial constructs, but they are also socially designed to accommodate new interests. Now, one question that India or the policymakers in India, academicians who study India's eastward engagement fail to understand is why was India not part of the Asia Pacific? Despite the fact that the very set of countries which now propose, uh, which have now proposed Indo-Pacific were, were not in favor of India joining the Asia Pacific construct. So there I think, uh, it is a two-way process. India's relationship has bolstered with, uh, with the US, but also uh, with Japan, which was the last country to respond warmly to India's uh, look east overtures. But this Indo-Pacific is still not an, uh, a step to bandwagon with the US. And that we see uh, almost every month when uh, US and India uh, stand on opposite sides on the Russian question. I think over the past three years, India has, uh, 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 Foreign Minister Jashankar himself has conducted at least four dialogue uh, mechanisms to engage Russia and also uh, persuade them to, to uh, come up with their own Indo-Pacific approach, if not their own approach, at least support, endorse the idea of Indo-Pacific. And that is something on which we know that India's strategic autonomy or India's own approach to Indo-Pacific is not going to go away. Uh, in addition to those, there are many lateral trilateral components. Uh, Quad is one, and there are a number of them. I'll come to that later. Those elements are, those, uh, are pillars to deter China, but they are not directly related to the Indo-Pacific construct. I think here it is very important 
to distinguish, differentiate between Indo-Pacific and these new uh, trilateral, minilateral mechanisms that are coming up. So all in all, if we look at this transition, India's eastward engagement and this Indo-Pacific transition, uh, it is very clear that in the look east and act east policies, ASEAN was central continuity again uh, in Indo-Pacific as well. Institutional engagement with ASEAN was there in both, but in act east policy, we witnessed uh, expanded geographic scope. Economic reforms and opening up to the world in the post-Cold post War uh, era was important. But in both look east and act east policies, it was very clear that India was trying to avoid confrontation with China. It was a rule taker, abiding by the rules, whatever was given, dialogue partner status or sectoral partner, denied entry into the APEC. India did not protest. In the Act East policy, this engagement strengthened. But what has changed in the Indo-Pacific is a couple of things. One, with Indo-Pacific policy, it is very clear that India has evolved from rule taker to a rule maker. A number of initiatives have also been proposed. Uh, the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative is one. Uh, Sagar is another one. Uh, adding normative dimension, uh, I think I've already talked about it, but uh, India's tireless efforts to distinguish between Indo-Pacific and Quad, I think it, it, it is, uh, it makes a strong case there. Post Galwan and uh, post Doklam and Galwan, I think it is very clear that for, in, for India at this moment, China poses an existential threat. And yet the normative dimension, normative contribution of India is that it has not engaged any of the Southeast Asian countries in creating any kind of mechanism that, uh, that overlooks ASEAN sensitivities or Southeast Asian sensitivities. There is a lot of talk about Quad and Quad Plus, but India, so far as I know, India has not been involved in, in persuading any of the Southeast Asian countries uh, there. And uh, lastly, I think uh, the, the mechanisms that are there, the mini lateral mechanisms uh, also play an important role there. So, To conclude, I think uh, I'd say that India's strong support to the Indo-Pacific is driven by the fact that this new construct or the emerging regional order, if you will, not only includes India, but keeps it at the center stage. And that is different from the Asia, Asia Pacific. And that is why India is very much in favor of uh, Indo-Pacific. Indo-Pacific also celebrates the rise of India the re-emergence of Japan and return of European powers to this part of the world. And this time, uh, the return of European Union, for example, or France is more on the sides of rules-based order of protecting uh, global commons and global goods. Yes, China's unprecedented rise is a concern for some and uh, its aggressive behavior is a matter of anxiety for many, but I believe that Indo-Pacific uh, is not just about that. Indo-Pacific is not just about China or uh, a, 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 an anti-China club of sorts or US-China uh, hegemonic competition. I think it is much more than that. Uh, it is Indo-Pacific is the central screen in the emerging multiplex order, if I may borrow the term coined by Professor um, Amitasharya. It's a central screen where after a long, long time, we are finding small, middle, and major powers, all of them contributing, all of them doing their bits to ensure a peaceful, inclusive, free, and rules-based order. Of course, as per their interest. And this is what explains the divergence in approaches. Indonesia has a diverge, uh, different approach than Australia. India has uh, slightly different than the US. And yet, all these countries are pitching for their own versions without fearing a backlash. So this regional order, which is being shaped, is not designed, devised by the hegemon. It is being worked upon by a number of countries. 
And that I think is another salient feature of the Indo-Pacific, which uh, India particularly likes. So to conclude, I would say in, uh, that this feature makes Indo-Pacific much more uh, democratic and much more inclusive. It also gives India an opportunity uh, to come back to the region after centuries. I mean, uh, it was uh, during the pre-colonial times that India was this powerful and India was this engaged with the region. I'll stop here and welcome questions.